hello, I'm Nick Valentino, uh, current president of the of ISPP. Welcome. Uh, let me first repeat a very brief version of the welcome I gave several hours ago uh, before our first panels of the first ever virtual ISPP conference uh, began. Um, I don't have time to talk to you about the, the, the journey that our organization has been going through these last many months, but of course, I'm sure that many of you have had uh, similar journeys and had to navigate similar uh, uh, obstacles in your life. I hope all of you are safe and that you are uh, healthy and please remain remain so. Um, I wish that I could be with all of you. I know that that I've already been looking at some of the, the, the panels that have occurred this morning and I'm just really uh, both sad but also very excited about the work that's being done in ISPP. I want to briefly extend my, my thanks to the members, um, to the leadership team, the Governing Council and ISPP staff who worked extremely long and hard over the last few months since March when we decided that we needed to go online with this meeting uh, and to make this event possible. A task force was put together, I put together, uh, which included Seth Bennett, Thomas Kramer, Chris Federico, Anna Kende, Liliana Mason, Shelley McGowan, and Heather Schlebaugh, uh, and they just worked so hard to get this together. We, we owe a special debt of gratitude to Lily Mason and Thomas Kramer, our fearless program chairs, uh, who this year were willing to take on the challenge of really putting together two programs, two separate programs. One, the actual in-person program, and then this one, the virtual one, uh, which spans across multiple time zones. Uh, and um, so I, I don't know how actually to thank them. If I were in person, I would thank them with something other than words for sure. Uh, but I'll do that as soon as we can get back together. I hope you all get a chance if you see them, when you see them, to, to give them thanks. These are extraordinary scholars in their own right, and they took a ton of time out of their schedule to help us all. Um, thanks also go to their section chairs who worked many, many hours uh, serving ISPP. Uh, behind the scenes I, of ISPP, our central office staff, Seb Bennett and uh, the executive director and Heather Schlebaugh were just amazing. Uh, they, they, took the, the, they always take care of the operations of the day-to-day the -day, uh, organization, but they really stepped up in this, in this moment with tremendous effort and professionalism and their positive attitudes and energy I just got to experience day-to-day. Uh, -day. Of course, I've left many, many folks out of this brief thank you and welcome, but if you encounter the, the quality of this uh, uh, event, and hopefully it'll, it'll remain as, as energizing as I've seen it so far, please make sure that you give them your thanks. Uh, as you know, in lieu of a traditional presidential address, uh, I wanted to dedicate some time here to bringing some perspectives in that we may not, many of us may not hear as often as pr probably we should be hearing from in uh, ISPP. And these are four young leading scholars of black politics. Uh, that's not all they do, but it's one of the things they do to discuss how their work maybe can help sh shed some light on the current moment. Um, uh, this very disorienting moment. It's it's a difficult task to give to them to say, hey, what's going on and, and how can, what can we expect in the future? But I'm just feeling very lucky that, that uh, I asked if these four, four folks would be interested and they all readily agreed. So we're fortunate to have with us um, remarks by Antoine Banks of the University of Maryland, Davin Phoenix, the University of California at Irvine, LaFleur Stevens Duggan of Princeton University, and Ishmael White, who just moved, I guess, his whole family and house in the last week from Duke to Princeton. Uh, and they're all now here online with us to, to chat uh, about their work. These scholars are all doing award-winning, amazing, cutting-edge work, producing some of the most important insights about intergroup dynamics, emotion, identity processes, and mobilization. Uh, systematic racism in America, and also the racialization of the response to COVID-19, which we'll hear a little bit about today from the floor. Um, now, I, I said they're all award-winning scholars, but I did want to just mention that last night in the middle of the night, I received word that Davin Phoenix has just won the American Political Science Association's Ralph Bunch Book Award for his 2019 book, The Anger Gap, How Race Shapes Emotions 
in politics. And I'm hopefully he'll get to say a few words about that today. So this, this symposium is gonna be hopefully an opportunity for all of us to think about the role of racism and racial inequality in society as a whole, which many of you are working on, um, but also in our, specifically in our institutions and in the way that it changes the mobilization patterns that we might expect to see in the fall in the United States and perhaps in other places. So um, I have a few central organizing questions that this panel might speak on for a few minutes, but they can uh, use this time uh, however they like, and we'll come back at the end after each of them has had a chance to speak. And then we'll, we'll try to talk about what connects the work. I think it'll be easy to see. The title of the, of the panel is Race and Emotion in the Current Moment, Can Anger Bind a Diverse Social Movement? And I, and I wanna say that uh, Dr. Phoenix suggested I change the word bind to the word sustain. And I think that would actually be a good change here because it recognizes the fact that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement is likely to, to be, and by some estimates, the largest social movement in American history at the moment in terms of sheer size. So very quickly, the, the questions I would love to hear about, uh, and, and again, this is just a guiding set of questions, not, not uh, something that, that has to be stuck to, is um, that the conventional wisdom about anger uh, on the left suggests that we might actually see massive mobilization on the left, as a, uh, uh, at least in the US this fall, uh, because of the role of anger in mobilization. But much of the work that these scholars have done suggests that actually there are big differences across racial groups in the mobilization potential of, of that emotion. So that's one question, do they, do they feel that's gonna be true in the, in the fall? And second, the protests regarding the most recent spate of police violence against African-Americans in the US feels different to many scholars who study social movements. Do they think of this as a moment of, of lasting change is a question that was in my mind. And finally, how, how do the racial disparities in health outcomes uh, during the pandemic that we're seeing, both, especially in the U.S., affect politics. That is, uh, the racialization of the response to COVID is a very unfortunate but probably very consequential uh, dynamic, and, and, and we're going to hear a little bit about that. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being with us. I've taken too much time already, and please, we're going to start with uh, um, uh, Dr. Banks, then we're going to move I'm sorry, uh, Dr. White, then we're gonna move to Dr. Banks, then we're gonna move to Dr. Phoenix, and finally to Dr. Stevens Duggan. So uh, Ishmael, please take it away. All right, can y'all hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. All right, so thanks, Nick, um, and thanks for asking us to do this. Um, as, as Nick mentioned, the uh, uprisings of last month have once again brought race into the, the national spotlight, and. And it seems that every time events such as these occur, they catch the broader American public by surprise, leaving m many, particularly white Americans, sort of asking why or how did we get to this point? Uh, in my time, I will uh, talk briefly about race and racial group empowerment with, and, and less about my own work with the, my goal here would be to sort of add some context to these events, particularly for our international members. And, to, and in doing so, I, uh, I hope to sort of review some of the race and uh, political behavior literature in an effort to sort of set things up for Antoine Davin and Lafleur. Um, so to understand, uh, and to understand uh, uh, black and to some extent white Americans recent response to particularly the racialized police violence, uh, we have to understand the long fraught history of race in America. While that would obviously take much more time than I have here, I'm, I'm going to sort of preview Lafleur's work a bit by arguing that a simple way to understand race in America would be to think of it in the same way that we think of America's response to COVID. Right. In a very real way, racial injustice um, is a disease that afflicts America, and it has for quite some time. Uh, like COVID, it's, it's a disease that we have had many opportunities to redress, yet the way that America has chosen to deal with its race problem has been, again, much like COVID, little more than attempts to sort of wish it away. Uh, while at times uh, some have proposed bolder efforts at addressing racial inequalities, 
the, this country has generally seemed to sort of lack the national will to both grant Black Americans uh, full equality and affirmatively address racism in society. Thus, the disease has sort of festered, right? Um, the result of this unwillingness to adequately deal with racial inequality has been these periodic waves of uprisings by racial minorities, uh, most often African Americans, as they are the ones burdened with the constant need to demand the basic human rights guaranteed to most in society. <clears throat> as these uprisings come and go, many in the American public often uh, often demand for political elites to provide explanations. Uh, in response to these demands, uh, we've often gotten things such as the Kerner Commission of the late 1960s, which which established which was established by President Johnson to investigate the causes of what the commission referred to as race riots. Um, the, the current commission produced a highly influential report outlining their assessment of black American, of black life in America. Uh, while the commission identified institutional racism as part of the race problem, uh, one of the central conclusions was that blacks themselves were partly to blame for the race problem. A culture of dependency and the lack of two-parent families were prominent themes featured in the report. These findings uh, implied that the victims of the disease brought it upon themselves, downplaying governmental and societal responsibility. Uh, coming on the heels of the behavioral revolution, the black uprisings of the 1960s also inspired some of the first academic efforts to understand the political behavior of black Americans. And one of the most influential theoretical frameworks to come from this was the idea of racial group consciousness. So originally defined as a self-conscious awareness of one's status uh, as a member of a disadvantaged racial minority group, racial group consciousness was believed to inspire political engagement among Black Americans via some, some sort of internalized concern for improving the status of one's racial group. The concept which was first used to explain black, why Black Americans participated in certain forms of political behavior at higher rates than similarly situated white Americans um, or, um, it was held, heralded by some as this uh, psychological tool which could empower racial minorities into engaging in costly political behavior for the good of their racial group. Now, racial group consciousness would soon become one of the sort of central pillars of political psychology research and perhaps the most commonly referenced explanation of the distinct political behavior of racial minorities in the U.S. Now, despite its widespread acceptance among political behavior scholars, empirical assessments of the racial group consciousness to political participation link uh, have been anything but consistent. Over the past 20 years, a number of well-designed studies have failed to find any evidence of a relationship between racial group consciousness and the political activity of Black and Latino Americans. In fact, even one of the originators of the racial group consciousness theory has since questioned its continued importance uh, as an explanation of racial minority political behavior, citing, again, lack of consistent uh, evidence and their own ability to inability to replicate the findings from the 1960s. Uh, one of the major criticisms over the years of this racial, of the racial group consciousness theory has been its nebulousness. Uh, by our account, there are at least six different dimensions of the concept used within political psychology research. Uh, the lack of specific, specificity about what exactly is racial group consciousness belies its usefulness. Uh, other scholars such as Haynes Walton, for example, have noted that before we can see the psychological origins of minority political behavior, uh, it may be important to understand the real world constraints that exist on the behavior of repressed racial groups in the US. So take, for example, the fact that um, some of the early racial group consciousness studies uh, uh, looked at voting behavior right after the Voting Rights Act, right? Uh, and bear in mind that, that that was a point in American history in which a large proportion of Black populations had only j recently received the rights, uh, protections of, of their vote. Uh, even today, the cost of political action sort of conditioned the effect of uh, psychological resources such as racial group consciousness. Um, 
what then might this mean for how we understand the political behavior of racial minorities as well? It could mean that while racial group consciousness may reduce interracial inequalities, say between blacks and whites in political participation, uh, they may at the same time sort of uh, uh, exa exacerbate intra-racial differences between say resource poor and resource rich blacks. And so these are some things we may want to start thinking about. Thus, it sort of potentially offers a solution to racial inequality that sort of empowers the most privileged of the racial minority groups, effectively solving one, one inequality by reinforcing another. Um, what you're gonna see in a second from Antoine, Davin, and Lafleur are attempts to sort of advance our understanding of how political psychology can be used as a tool for effectively empowering Black Americans and addressing the systematic racism that persistently afflicts our society. From Antoine and Davin, we'll see attempts to move beyond the racial group consciousness framework of Black political behavior by innovatively building theories of emotion into racial, the racialized experiences of Black Americans and are, are building, building those theories from the racialized experiences of Black Americans. And from Lafleur, we'll see how the disease of racism and COVID interact to basically devalue Black lives. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ishmael. That was a wonderful introduction and, and uh, framework for us to, to work with. Um, so Antoine, would you like to go next? Antoine, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just want to say uh, thanks to Nick um, and the organization for organizing um, this important panel, especially given um, what we're seeing in contemporary times and giving us a greater understanding about how the research, particularly on Black politics and in general, more generally race and ethnic politics, can give us some insight um, to what we might expect and, and give it um, in the future and, and giving us an insight about what we might be seeing now. I um, also want to thank Ishmael for that uh, great introduction of bringing all of our work together and kind of organizing it um, for the viewers there, um, not only in the U.S., but um, overseas as well. Um, so today I I'm going to talk about, um, and this is a, a co-authored uh, paper with a panelist, Ishmael, um, and Brian McKenzie that um, we actually did win an award for this too. Uh, also, I'll put in a quick plug uh, in a political behavior, uh, the best article published uh, last year, um, which shows along with Davin Phoenix's work, the significance of black politics and the scholars that are doing uh, work in this area. But I'm gonna address Nick's first question about whether Democrats, um, particularly those on the left, can benefit from the anger we see around police brutality or racial injustice. And this stems from the um, police killings that we see, particularly um, um, in terms of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, and the anger that um, once again, we see the black community experiencing due to the uh, injustices of unarmed black men and women um, killed at the hands of police, uh, largely for just minor infractions. And these instances of racial injustice has brought to the surface for a large number of Black strong feelings of anger and emotional pain. And this emotional pain isn't something that's new. We've seen this uh, previously with um, killings of Tamir Rice, um, Walter Scott, I can go in the 90, uh, 1990s with um, Rodney King. And so the questions we were interested in our paper is what type of actions would we see from Blacks um, when they feel angry about race, right? Will we see them engage more in what people consider to be mainstream politics or electoral politics? Will they rally behind a particular party, which usually is, um, is the Democratic Party? Would they be more likely to vote? Or would they engage in a different type of politics? The politics that maybe a lot of viewers aren't here um, familiar with, but a lot of people and a lot of scholars in race and ethnic politics are, and it was what we call black politics. And by black politics, we mean um, actions that blacks have engaged in that uniquely serves their interests. And the type of actions that these tend to be are actions such as protesting or rallying behind or supporting black organizations like NAACP. And we saw historically that could have been SNCC, 
So the question is, when Blacks feel angry about race, what type of actions will they be mobilized to engage in? Now, there's been a lot of work and emotions, uh, particularly from um, Nick and others, looking at the effects that anger has in engaging people in politics. And the evidence is pretty consistent on this front, that it is a mobilizing emotion. But we were interested in, well, what type of actions would be mobilized, particularly among certain groups, when they feel angry? And is that behavior the same for everyone? And so we theorized in this paper that when Blacks are angry about race, they're likely to engage in actions that they believe will resolve the problem. So for Blacks, what type of actions do they believe will resolve the problems of race, racism, or racial injustice? And like um, other scholars like Haynes Walton, Michael Dawson, and others have argued that Black politics is seen as an avenue of venue in which that has helped them in, um, overcome these difficulties of racial injustice. Um, there's also work from Shana Nully at UConn that um, shows that from a large number of Blacks, there has a strong sense of disillusionment and, uh, disillusionment and distrust about whether um, the political system can deal with the issues in the Black community. And we believe because of this work, we were on um, good grounds to suspect that when Blacks feel angry about race, um, they're more likely to engage in in actions such as protesting or rallying behind Black organizations because they're more likely to trust these organizations because historically there have been, um, um, there's been proof or evidence that they have been able to help them overcome some of the systemic racism um, and injustice that they experience. And we believe that they're less likely to trust that mainstream politics will help them overcome their problems. So these were the predictions um, that we largely wanted to test in our paper. Um, and these are the uh, predictions that I'm going to show to you uh, in the presentation. We also had some um, hypotheses about which type of Blacks would be more likely to engage in Black politics, that not all Blacks are homogeneous in the way they think about ways to resolve racial inequality. And one group that we thought would be particularly susceptible to engaging in these types of behaviors are those who adhere to a community nationalist perspective. But I could talk to you more about those results during the Q&A. But like any good social scientist, um, we thought really hard about what's the best way to test our predictions. And one way in which we want to see whether anger caused um, an increase in participation among Blacks, um, given a lot of work, particularly by Nick and Ted and others, um, was conducting an experiment. And so for our experiment, our main goal here was to manipulate emotion in the context of race. And so with that being said, we essentially wanted to make our Black respondents either angry about race or not angry about race. So we wanted to keep race constant. And we did this in two ways. The first way was, first way was having them read a Washington Post news story, which I'm not going to focus on here. Um, and, and in this news story, we simply just had Obama expressing anger about um, how the economy, particularly the recession, devastated the Black community. Um, in our second uh, um, experiment, we had our respondents write about, particularly our Black respondents, write about things that made them feel angry about race. So it's what we refer to as an emotion induction uh, task. And here we just asked them to write about all the things that made them feel angry about race. That was our treatment. Our baseline control condition asked them simply just to write their thoughts about race. We also had a hope condition here, which I'm not going to go into, but I'd be happy to um, talk to you about our predictions in regard to that treatment. And I just wanted to give you an example about what our respondent, or one respondent, wrote about when he felt uh, angry about race. Now, we, they could write about anything about race. It didn't necessarily have to be a specific topic. We just wanted to see what um, things they uh, held responsible for their anger when it came to race. And I think this is pretty informative, not only for our theory, but what we see in the contemporary times, particularly when it comes to um, police uh, brutality. So here is, um, I'm trying to, can you guys see the open-ended response? If I click it. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. So here is a black um, respondent to open-ended response in an anger condition. And we had several examples of these. So this is just a one, but this individual says, a past issue that has really bothered me and made me very angry is reading the police report from the officer that shot and killed Michael Brown. Just reading what he claims happened and gave him, sorry, and gave cause to him shooting and killing Mr. Brown. 
If an 18-year-old is caught walking down the street with stolen items by a police officer, especially a black man, which he puts in caps, will either run, this is the norm, or depends where they are when they are caught, will probably surrender. And in caps, he puts no way will they confront and insult an officer with the stolen items in his hand. Not sure how anyone is able to do all what the officer claims with the stolen items in his hand. I don't like seeing stories on how they portray young black men in the news or the press. So here we clearly see that this individual is angry, particularly about the police killing of, of Michael Brown. But what we think is even more informative is that there's a strong sense of distrust about what is being reported. So I hear we see that blacks are questioning the institutions that govern them, um, like the police. And I think this is consistent with uh, Nully's uh, work on um, the black community and their feelings of disillusionment. For a more systematic analysis of our open-ended respondents, I just wanted to show you, um, we coded respondents, um, open-ended response to see what they were more likely to mention when they felt angry, hopeful, or a baseline condition in terms of um, they're writing their thoughts about race and the control condition. And we see here in the black that most blacks, when they feel angry about race, they're talking about individual prejudice or in, uh, systemic racism, right? Almost 50% of them write about these instances uh, when they're angry about race. But we also see police brutality, also a high number of them writing about um, instances that they experienced at the hands of police or other blacks have experienced at the hands of the police that made them angry. Um, when we look at um, Obama and the Democratic Party, we don't really see them um, attributing a lot of anger to them, which seems to make sense. Now, given that I, we see what Blacks are likely to feel angry about and write, and write about when they are angry, right, which is what we would expect, what are some of the consequences or the behavioral consequences of which we'll see? I know my time is right, um, kind of coming up, so let me um, um, go through these fairly quickly. But what we find here at least for one of our studies, and this is the first study, um, we had four outcome measures, protesting, uh, donating to a black organization, donating to the Democratic Party and voting. And we see here when it comes to um, protesting that when blacks are made to feel angry about race, they are about 12 points uh, more likely to say they're gonna go out and protest than when they're not feeling angry about race. We find about a six point difference when it comes to donating to black organizations, although that difference is insignificant. And for our more mainstream uh, politics like voting and donating to the DNC, we don't find any significant differences between our treatment condition and our control condition. So here, at least for the first study, we do find some evidence that when Blacks are angry, they're more likely to engage in this uh, type of um, Black protest uh, behavior, such as protesting. But there wasn't as strong of an evidence when it came to um, donating. But not necessarily do they, uh, um, at least in immediate sense, go out and say they're going to uh, turn out. Uh, or engage in electoral politics. Um, so for our second study, we just um, wanted to have a more better measure of participation. And this really came down to Ishmael's insight in, in terms of developing um, a way to actually gauge whether people will participate in black organizations versus more liberal universal organizations. And simply where we ask respondents um, whether they would like to donate $10 uh, that we would give them to various organizations. So we had three black organizations and three universal organizations. I'm not gonna go into that. I can talk to you more about that during a Q&A. But what we see here is when blacks feel angry about race, they're significantly more likely to donate money to black organizations like the NAACP um, relative to when they don't feel angry about race. And they're not more likely to donate to these more universal liberal organizations like um, the AFL-CIO or the Democratic Party when they feel angry. And we also see that there's a difference. And not only are they more likely to donate to black organizations when they feel angry relative to the baseline, but they're also significantly more likely to donate to black organizations than universal organizations. So what does this all mean for the upcoming um, um, 2020 election? And we believe um, that these results can give us some insight to whether Democrats are going to benefit in 2020. Um, our results suggest that not necessarily if these issues of racial injustice and racism um, become an important part of the campaign, that Blacks might not necessarily believe that Democrats are the best option in terms of overcoming these uh, issues. That historically, 
when they feel um, so historically that they feel that um, engaging more in black politics has helped them deal with racial injustice in society. So as blacks become more angry about these issues, they might just turn to these type of solutions to deal with the threat and might not necessarily um, gravitate to the Democratic Party. We still think the Democratic Party could do some work to improve their standing in helping the black community, which might kind of decrease their distrust about whether they could tackle uh, racial issues. But I'm gonna wrap it up here and I probably went over my time. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Antoine. Um, before we move to Davin's work, I just wanted to mention that if you, uh, the audience, would like to ask questions of the panel, I'm not sure how much time we'll have. Our time is short. We have to move on to the next uh, panels of the day. But please use that uh, question box in the in the sidebar if you're listening, uh, if you have questions. I would prefer that you be in room one. That'll make it easier for me to moderate the questions. But if you're in any room, I'll look around and, and look and see if I can see questions for the panel and maybe have a few questions uh, for them at the end after they have a chance to, to talk in a roundtable fashion. Uh, so Dr. Phoenix, it's, it's you're up next. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to jump right in. I think what I have to say dovetails nicely with uh, Antoine's comments. I've been thinking a lot because people ask me to think about whether this current uh, moment of unrest, whether there's a clear through line between that and the expectation of energized black or minority turnout in 2020. And my work leads me to be skeptical of that for two reasons. Um, so drawing on my work, particularly the book, The Anger Gap, uh, National survey data that I look at and experiments I've conducted, uh, I find consistently that African Americans are less prone, uh, despite the uh, stereotype of the angry black man, angry black woman, to express or report anger over political figures, climates, and policies. And further, the association between anger over politics and political action is much weaker among African Americans than for their white counterparts. Whereas I find reported anger being, as expected by much of the conventional wisdom, um, Report anger being strongly and positively associated with the host of actions among white Americans, donating, canvassing, contacting local officials, attending town halls and meetings, and also protesting, boycotting. I find among African Americans uh, and also amongst Latinx and Asian Americans as well that anger exhibits a null or substantively much smaller impact on those actions. And there's one exception to that. Uh, and Antoine kind of set us up for this. It is in the domain of system system challenging actions, protests, demonstrations, uh, boycotts. We get a small window into this racial angry app in the gap uh, that you see on screen using pooled ANES data to look at the intersection of race, partisanship, and anger. Uh, so these are predicted probabilities amongst uh, black and white Democrats, respectively, of uh, reporting maybe being uh, angry about the Republican presidential candidate or incumbent between the years 1980 and 2016. And so we see that when controlling for demographics, socioeconomic resources, and uh, indicators of political engagement, black Democrats typically uh, are less prone to express anger than their white Democratic counterparts, uh, with exceptions in 2016 and um, 88. Uh, this is despite black Democrats uh, reporting significantly higher levels of dissatisfaction with Republican presidential incumbents during this time period, both overall more dissatisfaction and uh, more dissatisfaction with the handling of the economy among those Republicans. So that greater dissatisfaction is not translating to greater reported anger. And it's also not translating to greater reported fear as well. Uh, so I argue that this hesitation to express that anger, and in addition, the translation of that anger to system challenging actions, but not system oriented actions, uh, is rooted in the combination of psychological and structural forces that work in tandem to inhibit anger's activation or constrain its impact on black behavior. Uh, to go a little deeper in that, we can see some, let's see, race of interview effects in the mean responses of black and white partisans. So small sample size, so I'll do caveats, but we see from that right, white, right column, when black Democrats have a black interviewer, they're actually much more likely to say, yes, a Republican candidate or incumbent made me angry. And so I think that speaks to how African Americans can be acutely aware of the uh, social costs of being angry while black. What are the risks of being stigmatized? What are the risks of having your claims be delegitimized because you have that label of an angry black person? And even more deeply than that, what are the risks of in facing increased surveillance from the state? 
So I want to turn to some open-ended responses, like similar to the study, the award-winning study by uh, White, Manx, and McKinsey. I conducted a national study in January 2018 with a national sample of nearly 1,000 Black and white Americans, and I asked them to report, reflect on what made them angry about politics, and cited, you know, many people express anger about uh, corruption or politicians that are kind of out for themselves. And I think what I saw in terms of trends emergent from the Black responses are really illustrative of the ways in which how Black people are responding to political threats is uh, informed by factors that we know are important in shaping emotional responses. Primarily, their sense of collective agency as a racial group or their lack thereof, uh, their sense of whether these political threats they are encountering or reflecting on represent from the, for them a departure from a norm of a system that operates fairly or if those threats reflect the fact that the system has never had those norms as it applies to African-Americans. And also, how do these interpretations of these threats or these reflections uh, indicate or actually reflect their acute awareness of the potential social ramifications or costs of expressing anger. So I just want to highlight a few of the open-ended responses and how they uh, reflect some of these themes that were really more present amongst the Black participants in the study than their white counterparts. So I'll pull up these first two uh, responses. You see this 24-year-old man didn't talk about anything specifically political. He talked more broadly about uh, not even systemic, but maybe even social racism, right? Uh, makes me anxious for blacks to still be treated less respectfully and not be liked because of our skin color. Someone outside my race does a hairstyle, it's trendy, but if my race does it, it's a disgrace, right? So this person's registering their anger at cultural appropriation, this broader racial sense when talking about what makes them angry with this political prompt. Uh, this person uh, below, this 32-year-old woman, talks about not only issues facing African-Americans, but also Latinx Americans as well, uh, being treated unfairly with no right to anything basic, well, the white American will get uh, without stress. And also talking about this kind of recurrent theme without, within black discursive spaces of kind of working twice as hard to get half as far. Notice also the emotive language being used here, not one of anger or indignation, but you see that last word, they're living in fear. Interestingly enough, about a third of the black respondents in this condition talked about something explicitly racial when talking about what made them angry about politics compared to only about 6% of whites. And about a third of those black participants uh, identified something that I would label as systemic or a structural issue as the object of their anger. In comparison, only about 8% of white participants identified structural, broad role, systemic objects of their anger. 90% of white participants identified specific objects of their anger, such as party they don't like, a set of uh, uh, policies or individuals or gridlock. There's a lot of anger directed about gridlock and polarization. In contrast, only about 53% of black participants ID'd something specific and kind of concrete political as their object of anger. And as we see from these last two examples, when they did, you see clear indicators of that lack of collective efficacy or agency. So this person is giving a litany of things they feel angry about, this 45-year-old woman here, right? But notice they're not talking about, I'm incensed about this, I'm tired. Right? So we have to reckon with this role of exhaustion, or what I call racial resignation, the degree to which African Americans see this unrelenting onslaught of political threats or things that they are dissatisfied by. But rather than feel a sense of indignation, right, they feel a sense of just, I'm tired of it because this is daily unrelenting action or kind of reality of life, despite who seems to be in positions of power, controlling the levers of power. I'm tired of officers getting off. I'm tired of women not giving equal pay. I'm tired of health care being so high. I think this uh, final woman here, the worst part of it is we as Americans can do nothing to change it. And right? I think that was a very palpable sense that I got from these responses that was not shared to nearly the same effect amongst uh, their white counterparts. And so we can think about how that sense of resignation can really constrain uh, anger. And so while we see this moment of unrest, I'm skeptical about it necessarily translating to the election, but I'm also mindful of the ways in which many people are failed by uh, police violence and they do not inspire the same degree of protests. And why is that, right? Maybe we can think not just about the scope of this protest, but why we don't see these protests more often since these things being protest protested are such a fact, such a common fact of black life. So in addition to the condition, um, asking people to reflect what made them angry about politics, I also asked a subset of people what made them angry about race. Um, Oh yeah, I forgot these additional parts, but. So I ask people to think, okay, similar to uh, the White et al. study, right? What makes you angry about racial issues and kind of maybe specifically racial controversies and issues around policing? I wanna highlight just one person's response here. Uh, they gave uh, a very in-depth 
right, and very bracing uh, assessment, right? Police brutality is militarized to slavery. The country will never be an ally of a black man or woman. The systematic vehicles of oppression plus the post-traumatic slavery syndrome and mental colonization perpetuate these events into continuity. I thought this could be a potential collaborator right here, the way this person is articulating <laughs> these issues. Um, but actually, here's what the last line is that this person said. We just need to work together more and police ourselves, right? So after this really bracing kind of condemnation of the systematic racism in society, this person actually ends by turning the gaze inward not towards these objects that need to be challenging and tested, but turned that gaze and shifted the burden of responsibility to black people to actually regulate their responses to this condition. And so I think that's really important for us to wrestle with. How are the same kind of systemic structural kind of recalcitrance to black demands, not only fueling actions, but also maybe constraining uh, actions that people might otherwise take. I see a resonance here with the off-quoted thought from James Baldwin, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious, to be raged almost all the time, we often see that first part of the quote, but how often do we see the second part that I added here and just emboldened, so that the first problem is how to control that rage so that it won't destroy you. And so I think as we uh, continue to grapple with the forces that shape this current moment of unrest, and also we try to make sense of how this resurgence of Black-led activism is fueled by sentiments and emotions as much as it is by ideologies and strategies, we need to be really be grappling with how those sentiments and emotions are shaped and constrained by those very same structural forces and the bounds. Uh, so I'll go ahead and end there. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much, Devin. That is really fascinating, uh, fascinating presentation and, and really interesting work. Uh, I see the questions coming in to the to the um, uh, the question box. I, I appreciate those. Hopefully, we'll have a few minutes at the end after uh, Dr. Stephen Stuggan, Dr. Uh, Stephen Stuggan, uh, presents her work. Um, it, it, I'll let her, of course, introduce it. But it is a little bit of a departure from this previous discussion we've been having, in that it focuses back on whites and the racialized nature of their reaction to COVID, which I think it, it, it complicates this discussion very. Uh, deeply, but it's also got resonance with everything that uh, all, all of us have been saying here. Dr. Steven Stuggan. Okay, so thanks for that kind introduction and for the opportunity to participate today. Um, so as Nick noted, I will be a bit of a departure from the rest of the panel, but I think it's still very relevant in terms of uh, some of the discussions that we're having today, particularly as Ishmael framed it as racism as a disease. So what I'm interested in is uh, specifically with respect to uh, this current political moment is the coronavirus pandemic, right? And so when we think about the pandemic, you know, back to when we were maybe living our blissful lives in early 2020, um, you know, we were hearing these reports coming in from China and what they were dealing with in Wuhan. But the sort of, I think, general notion was that um, COVID-19 was going to be this uh, great equalizer, right? So regardless of one's station in life, whether uh, you were rich or poor, uh, old or young, uh, you were susceptible to contracting the disease, right? Fast forward to March and we saw um, quite early on that it seemed that there was going to be a disproportionate impact on black communities. Right. And, you know, this reminds me of that old adage, essentially, that when uh, white America catches a cold, black America uh, catches the flu and arguably in this case, uh, maybe even pneumonia. And so I was interested in whether the response, uh, particularly of uh, strong uh, Republicans and moderate Republicans would be impacted uh, by the sort of disproportionate impact that the disease was shown to have on Black communities, right? So I fielded um, initially a pilot back in April, but then subsequently another study with a nationally representative uh, sample of roughly 600 white Americans, right? And I was interested in seeing whether there would be uh, what we might refer to as a backlash effect with respect to these racial disparities numbers. And there's some, you know, several reasons why we might think this is the case. So some of Nick's own work actually has shown us about the kind of uh, tight link uh, between race and uh, partisan identity, right? And so uh, we know, for example, that we've seen uh, in recent years, say post-Obama, 
you know, non-college educated whites uh, leaving the Democratic Party uh, in greater numbers to the Republican Party. We also know um, that many, uh, you know, many Americans are aligning along the two uh, major parties in the United States along racial lines, where we see more people of color aligning with the Democratic Party and more white Americans aligning with the Republican Party. And in particularly, those who were more racially resentful uh, to be aligned with the Republican Party. Um, so I was interested, again, as to whether this backlash effect would occur. And much of what we've seen with respect to any sort of um, division along uh, the response to COVID-19 has been largely uh, a partisan story, right? So we know that Democrats are reporting more concern about uh, the behavior of, of the impact of the virus, more concern about uh, engaging in behavior that's seen to stop the spread of the pandemic. So things like wearing a face mask, avoiding large gatherings, things of that nature. But much of what we've heard has been just strictly a partisan story. And I'd argue that what uh, the missing link from some of this uh, partisan story is actually a racial effect as well. And so uh, respondents were randomly assigned uh, to either a control condition in which they got essentially race neutral information about uh, the coronavirus, right? So as of May 21st, 2020, you know, there have been more than uh, 1.5 million cases of COVID-19. I'm not going to read it at length, but they essentially got information about the number of cases in uh, certain states and uh, the number of deaths. Part of the reason for um, not providing any sort of national numbers at the time is essentially that the national numbers in terms of racial disparities were not available. But it was already kind of, we were already kind of getting a trickling of this information about these racial disparities as early as April, uh, with even President Trump acknowledging that it was disproportionately harming black communities, and um, as well as his Surgeon General who kind of chastised uh, both black and Latinx communities around, you know, not putting Big Mama at risk or, you know, their abuelas, right? And so already, even though um, eventually the New York Times had to sue uh, the CDC to even get these uh, racial disparities numbers for the states that were releasing uh, their COVID cases and mortality rates um, by race, we were already seeing uh, this uh, disparity. So again, uh, in the control condition, it's just race neutral, but in the treatment condition, we see um, we see essentially the same information, but I added, you can see what's underlined, um, information about uh, the racial disparities. So whereas in the control, they just got, for example, in New York, which has the country's largest numbers of confirmed cases and deaths, over 22,000 people have died. They get this additional information, but uh, African Americans are three times as likely to die as whites. In Michigan, over 5,000 people have died from the virus, but Blacks, African Americans are five times as likely to die from the virus, and so on and so forth. And these were numbers that were as accurate as to the time that the data were collected. I should note that the data were collected during the period of uh, May 21st through May 26, 2020, so actually right before um, the BLM protests took off in response to uh, the killing of George Floyd. And so um, I was then, you know, subsequently interested in terms of what would happen uh, with the people who were treated with this racial disparity information relative to those who got the race neutral uh, or the uh, control condition that was absent of any racial information. Uh, in the interest of time today, and you know, because I want to leave room for lots of questions, I'm only going to present results for one dependent variable. But uh, do know that these results are replicated among um, a variety of questions that respondents were asked about. I should also note that I expected, given uh, what we've seen in terms of the partisan response, that we were likely to see, um, or I hypothesized, that we would see uh, this backlash effect most concentrated among those white Republicans who identified as either strong Republicans or moderate Republicans. So the results that I'm going to present to you next are for uh, essentially strong and moderate Republicans, excluding people who would uh, identify as you know what we'd call leaners, and we're comparing those strong and moderate Republicans 
relative uh, to all other white Americans in the sample. Okay, so you can see here that we're looking, can you see the full slide? Yep. Okay, um, so, okay, so looking at the effects of racial disparity information and partisanship on strongly agreeing that shelter in place orders are a threat to individual freedom. So a little bit about this dependent variable, uh, people were asked on a five point Likert scale from uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree, whether they thought shelter in place orders or stay at home orders uh, that were being issued at the time were a threat to their individual freedom. You can see here that people in uh, the dark bars, those represent the strong and moderate Republicans and uh, the white bars represents everyone else who uh, didn't identify as a strong or moderate Republican. And essentially, uh, we can see that in the control condition, there's about a 13% chance of ag strongly agreeing that uh, these orders were a threat to individual freedom, but this jumps almost doubles um, in the treatment condition when they get treated with that information about the racial disparities. So again, uh, the two conditions are identical, save for the information about uh, the increased mortality ri rates for African Americans. Also of note is that uh, there's actually a decrease in this sort of endorsement of uh, this idea of being a th uh, these shelter in pl place orders being a threat to individual freedom uh, for people who were not strong Republican partisans. And so maybe there's a little bit of hope there in the sense that we can see these groups moving in opposite directions. Um, and I'm able to replicate these uh, effects with respect to uh, whether things like religious services should be allowed without any restrictions, whether, uh, you know, reopen the state protesters, uh, people who we saw protesting in state capitals uh, like, um, you know, Lansing and Madison, Wisconsin, people like that, whether they should be fined and ticketed for that behavior. Essentially, whenever treated with uh, this information about racial disparities, the strong Republican partisans became more resistant to any sort of efforts to spread the, uh, to stop the spread of the pandemic. But I'll leave it there so that we could at least have um, some time for question and answer. Thank you so much, uh, uh, LaFleur. That, that's really fascinating, important work. I know that this is, we're all going to be thinking about these issues. I've got a lot of really great questions in the moderator uh, bar, and I'd like to maybe just maybe ask a couple of them in the remaining time we have. We have um, only seven minutes, so I don't know how many we'll get to, but um, if you don't mind me curating, uh, and forgive me to all of you in the audience if I don't get to your question, because we are very limited and I have to jump into another room uh, to introduce our, our keynote speaker next. So uh, please forgive me for not being able to get to all of them. Um, one of the questions was um, one of the questions was for for Antoine Banks, and the question is: We have seen more white people. Actually, it's for all of you, but it's directed to Antoine. We have we have seen more white people participating in the recent protests than in the past thinking about the 2020 US presidential election, so perhaps the effect on, of voting on for Democrats will be stronger for white Americans than for black Americans. I would say, you know, maybe Davin and, and Antoine could, could make a, a prognostication about that. Antoine? Sure, sorry. Um, I think that's a great question. And I think, you know, when we think about the work of Tesla and Sears, it might speak to this about who are these whites out there protesting on behalf of a police brutality. I'm gonna keep my answer pretty short, but I would suspect those individuals would be really, or more likely be racial liberals. They're the ones who are being motivated to engage in this. And that necessarily, um, will that benefit Democrats? Those individuals might've participated anyway. So I don't know if they're moving people who might not necessarily be predisposed to being sympathetic to these causes. Um, so I, I still think it's unclear whether getting those who are moderate on, you know, on say the classical racial resentment scale out um, to um, support Democrats, given, you know, the anger that they're feeling um, is still an open question. So I'll leave it there. I'll just say super briefly, I think we can consider in addition to the scholars Antoine cited, you know, Jennifer Tudy's work on racial sympathy. And I, my curiosity about how that solidarity here translates to the election, I think goes to, if this is the same group that was much more aligned behind Progressive Democratic candidates and could potentially be expressing being much more on the fence about Joe Biden. I think we have to see that tension, right, between 
pushing for change through kind of system challenging versus kind of electoral systems. And I think many black voters that vote out of position of precarity can see Biden as the lesser of quote unquote two evils, right? And need to kind of preserve an opportunity to do no harm. And so how do those sympathetic younger white cohorts that are much more sympathetic towards more radical change um, also understand that precarity and say, we need to be solidarity and allies in the voting booth as well to minimize harm while still recognizing that we can still accomplish more of our radical aims beyond electoral politics. But I think that's an interesting tension in terms of interracial solidarity in the polling place versus the sites of protest that's right for more kind of conversation. Thank you, Davin. Uh, this is a, another question, very important, comes in actually directed to Davin. You seem to be suggesting that the anger that Blacks are experiencing, expressing, is not necessarily a, a reflection of the anger they are experiencing. So they're expressing something they're not experiencing or vice versa. Is there a way we could possibly dissociate expressed anger from experienced anger and look at the effects of each separately? Yeah, I'll try to keep it super brief. I think that's a really good question. I think a really fruitful opportunity. I mean, I'm gonna wonder if, you know, Ismail and Antoine have also seen those kinds of issues with the social desirability concern or the kind of structural impediments on expressing that anger. So how do we tap into what is felt, but isn't necessarily willing to be communicated in certain spaces? I mean, what role do we have as researchers and thinking about the access that we have or do not have some based on the identities we carry? And I've really thought about how I might be able to attract or, you know, get different answers, right? Get different reports of anger, speaking to black communities face to face as opposed to fielding something online where they don't know who's on the other end of this. But I think that's really a valid question that makes us think about, right? Kind of what our agency and our responsibilities and powers and limitations are as researchers and kind of getting at the true remote responses, right? Versus the socially acceptable ones. Thank you. Uh, there's a question coming in for all of you, but uh, LaFleur, there's a question that just says, basically, I'd love to hear about the other dependent variables uh, that you investigated. You mentioned some really briefly, but in your brief time, you only focused on one or two. Um, and so I don't know if you want to talk about one or two others. Sure. Um, I don't have the numbers quite at hand, but for example, people were also asked about whether the United States should ease up restrictions and allow essentially non-essential businesses to reopen uh, with the caveat that even if that meant more people would die. And that was also associated with a statistically significant increase in wanting uh, a loosening up of these restrictions. Um, and so, uh, getting that sort of treatment with this racial disparities information actually was, again, associated with a uh, push to want to reopen the economy. Um, it was associated, I think I mentioned, with not wanting to find people who were engaging in any sort of risky behavior or uh, who were participating in reopen uh, the state protest and things of that nature, um, not wanting to think uh, also not thinking that wearing a face mask was important. So, you know, things that we think of as scientific and uh, evidence-based became, uh, you know, separated along partisan and arguably racial lines as well. Uh, yes, I, I, we have just a minute left, and I'm, I'm, uh, I wish I could continue to ask some of the questions that have come in, but I think maybe it would be best for me to just summarize by saying, um, given the question bar I'm receiving, that you, this work is, is of keen interest to many people in the organization, and I hope that um, members could uh, maybe avail themselves of trying to email you if they had questions about your work or connect with you. I, I, I think that would be really great. Um, sometimes scientific knowledge uh, that we get from work like this is uh, leads us to be much more hopeful about the future, and sometimes it leads us, uh, as as Davin said, to for it, it's a, a little more bracing. And I think that some of the conclusions we're seeing here are a little bracing. It says we cannot count on people of color in this country to save the country and its institutions from the problems that have faced it for 400 years. Um, we have to continue to, to accept responsibility together for solving these problems, these deep systematic, systemic uh, problems and diseases that we all face, real, literal, symbolic, and uh, uh, at all levels. 
So I just liked, again, we're out of time. Uh, I'm so grateful to all four of you for taking time uh, at different times of your day and, and to share your work with us. I hope that we can hear a lot more from you in the future and welcome you to come, obviously, to come and attend ISPP meetings into the future as often as you can. Thank you very much.